Here we go. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's wonderful to be in Jersey. I've, I've been here once for about uh, six hours to do some filming, and it really rained. Like, really, really rained. It was freezing cold. And I've come back, which is good, and it's been really sunny, and I feel like I'm on holiday. And, and in honor of that, I'm going to be barefoot, if you don't mind, because it's too hot for shoes. So I'm just going to go barefoot. Right, so I want to talk about sustain designing modern, sustainable homes. That's really kind of my passion. That's what I get up in the morning for. Um, and I started um, it down this road. Uh, I studied architecture. I did, a, I, I did a, a BA in architecture. And then I went off and worked in Ethiopia. And I worked on an ecotourism place. And I kind of got very interested in, in sustainable architecture through that. I went and did an MA. And then while I was doing that MA, a kind of strange thing happened is I, I, I got a, a, a commission to do a TV series for Channel 5. And, and so I was. Uh, I, I did a thing called Modern British Architects in 2000, where I looked, actually, Will Allsop was one of the architects uh, that I, I filmed, and, and he died uh, three or four days ago, which is a tragedy, because he's a lovely man. Drank red wine almost every day uh, at work and smoked cigars. So, you know, he got to 70, so there's hope, right? You could live half as bad and probably get to, I don't know, 105. But, um, and, and so that was wonderful because it gave, gave me a chance to start my own practice. I'm not actually an architect. I only did my master's. I never did part three because uh, I started my own practice. And it's always been, well, they're not going to pay me anymore if I'm an architect. Uh, so why would I bother? And I'll just employ architects. So now we are, we're seven people. And I've got four architects. They've, they've got Polonex and Saabs. <laughs> uh, and I've, I've got no shoes. Uh, but, you know, that, that's the way it is. So, so I want to talk about designing what I've learned in, I think, 16 years I've been doing um, run, running Charlie Luxon Design. So I break it up. I want to talk about building sustainable homes. I think that's the kind of, I think, you know, if you understand how you build a low energy new house, I think then you can start to understand ideas and things around extending, converting, and renovating. So that's the kind of the way I'm going to, I'm going to send this up. So uh, I think there's a really important idea around sustainable homes in that you need to start thinking like a tree. Sounds a bit naff, but bear with me. Because if you take the identical seeds of a tree and you throw one over there and you throw one over there, they will grow into completely different things because of the ambient environments, the kind of environment in which they land, the, the kind of soil they're in, the wind, the light, the shade, etc. And that's what our homes need to do. They need to respond specifically to location. Because unlike anything else that we design pretty much, pretty much beyond civil engineering, they don't move buildings, they stay still. So the idea that you kind of can sort of toss them off a drawing board, having not really understanding site context is, is ridiculous. Because what you want to do when you're designing a low energy house is harvest the kind of ambient energy that's around that building. So you need to really understand context. They need to be unique. Uh, many, many people have asked me, it's like, well, what's your ideal home like? It's like, what's the site? I've got no idea what you're talking about until, until you see a site. And I think the, there's many, many principles around low energy housing, but the one that we come back to and that we sort of hold central really is the passive house principles, which you, you might or might, has, who's heard of passive house principles here? Yeah? Yeah, yeah okay. That's Pretty good. So it's a German idea developed by muesli eating people with curly hair and glasses, you know, smart people who drive Mercedes or BMWs probably, but they're, you know, they're very smart. And they came up with an idea that really if you design a house properly with a series of fundamental principles of lots of insulation, very good air tightness, mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, and the fabric of the building is incredibly high quality, so it's a sort of a fabric first approach, you, you can almost require no heating, okay? And this image sort of sums that up. On the right hand side here, you have a passive house block of flats, and on the left, you have a normal block of flats. It's, a, it's an infrared camera, so it, it's registering the surface temperature of the buildings on a cold day. So the building on the right is losing no heat because it's incredibly insulated and airtight. You can see someone's got a window slightly open there or a seal's failed, and you can see that. And then this building here is just belting heat out. Okay, so that principle of fabric first, that you, you do a lot of work around the walls, the windows, the floors, the roof, that's where we start. I, I think we've, we've been really sidetracked with our low energy architecture. 
and got really sucked into things like heat pumps and solar panels and solar thermal and rainwater. You know, all of that stuff is important, don't get me wrong. But if you don't get the fabric of the building right straight off and the design of the architecture right straight off, you're fighting a losing battle. So when you've designed a building that's incredibly, um, does all of those things, that's insulated and as, I, as I've said, then really you can rely on solar gain to provide at least half of the energy heating requirement you have in any building. Uh, but that's a kind of not a, not, a, not a kind of a straightforward deal, if you like, because there's a massive issue with a lot of low energy housing really overheating. Now, this idea of walls of glass in low energy housing, they're just it's, they're too hot. And we're getting an enormous issue with overheating in, in, in low energy buildings. And so you need to control the solar design. And, and, and one of the key things, so you've got ideas of you're using the sun, but you need to control that. So you want uh, winter sun and you don't want summer sun. So you need to have windows in the right locations. You need to be able to absorb that heat into thermal mass, and then you need to be able to distribute that around the building. And I'll sort of touch on that through, through various elements. But th these are the kind of the principles uh, of it. So uh, what I want to do is talk through some of the way in which we kind of tackle uh, houses through a, through a project, because it's sort of better to look at nice pictures than weird diagrams for too long in my experience. So this is a really nice site just outside Stroud. It was quite a challenging site. It's called Five Valleys View because you've got this incredible view with five valleys uh, running off it. But it's a really steep uh, sloping site. And we were asked by the clients to design a four bedroom home uh, for a family. And we, our target budget was about uh, 1,550 square meter, uh, pounds a square meter. Um, which, is, which is tight for, for a new build, and they wanted to get to, to near passive quality. So we had a real um, challenge because one of the key things around low energy buildings is also shape, okay? So you want a nice, simple shape because if you imagine all the animals that live in Antarctica or the Arctic, they're kind of spherical. And if you were designing super low energy buildings, they'd be windowless spheres which are really hard to build and even harder to sort of furnish, but that's what you do because the volume to surface area ratio is really low. As soon as you start making complicated sort of architectural shapes, the surface to volume area ratio gets higher and higher and higher. So you're getting more skin and therefore more heat loss for the volume you're creating inside. So that's one thing that we were fighting with. The second thing we were fighting with is a very tight budget. Every time you fold, like the skin is one of the most expensive things you create on a building, the facade and the roof. Um, every time you fold that, you get costs. So we knew straight away we had to design a really very simple building, a box, basically. And we had to ex sort of look at the site, so with these ideas about it stepping around. And we wanted to make that building as simple as possible because you then wanted to spend money on materials. So I think longevity is a really important thing in architecture. I think architects... Uh, fail miserably with the fourth dimension, with time. You know, we, we, we like to think our buildings stay still the moment they're completed, and they really don't. They age, they stain, they mark, they weather, and I think there is a, a kind of a failing within the, within the industry to, to kind of tackle that. We wanted to keep the building simple so we could use really high quality materials that would age well. And, and also we had this wonderful view. So the, the, the sort of the, the, the kind of the concept for the building is the monocular in Empire Strikes Back, Han Solo. Got that? Yeah, and normally people go, what are you talking about? Some of you Sky War, you know, Star Wars nerds are with me there. But you know, this idea of like, the, you know, like when you go to the pier and you put the, you know, the 10p in or whatever and you look through the hole, this idea of a viewing platform. So we kind of created a building that, that sort of sat on, on, on the site and really exploited the, the incredibly steep steps. So working on a very tight budget with a very, very challenging site. And, and, and having made it very simple, we wanted to use as nice materials as possible. So we're using, look to use sort of slate and, 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 and English, uh, English sort of larch. And we sort of painted it sort of in like a watercolor thing because the planners wouldn't get so scared of this quite modern box. Which kind of worked, although we did get, uh, we did get someone to complain that they, it was going to make people crash when they drove past it, which was a really interesting objection to planning. And luckily, they didn't, they didn't listen. So, so the third thing, so you've got, you got an idea of a building. It's a very simple shape. And actually, we did a lot of thermal modeling. We used a thing called PHPP, so the Passive House Planning Pack. I could show you some slides. This has some slides of pages of numbers, but it really doesn't mean a lot. But it, Passive House Planning Package is a 
really good, um, it's basically a really complex Excel spreadsheet where you build a model in like, the truest sense in numbers of the building, and then it tells you about the energy consumption, and you can use that to optimize where the windows are. Uh, so you then work out whether those windows are giving you heat through the year or losing you heat through the year. Uh, and you also work out what the overheating is likely to be, the likely energy consumption of the building. So that, that, that should be below 15 kilowatts per meter squared per annum. Like, lots, but we, our target, we were looking at about 12 kilowatts per meter squared per annum. So from a design perspective, we were on target for passive certification, although we didn't go for it because we couldn't afford the, that process. So having optimized, I think it's a really important, there's a few bits of technology, I think, that have come out of the low energy sort of growth that's happened over the last 15 years. And, and, and one of them really fantastic ones is thermal modeling, is to really model your building and optimize where windows are, how they're all going to function and understand that. And that's not to say that you don't have a window on the north side that's going to lose you heat if it's about the architecture, because actually architecture is about making people happy. That's, that's where you want to be first and foremost. Um, so, it, so when you've designed the building well, you need to insulate it. That's the it's really unsexy, this. I'm sorry. Bear with me. It'll get better. But insulation is about as exciting as it gets. And, and the big question we ask about insulation in our buildings, and, and the big question is sort of a, a kind of a, a philosophical one, if you like, is would you eat your dinner off it? Because whenever we're specifying any materials that we put into our homes, we're thinking about off-gassing. We're thinking about the, in, the quality of the internal environment they're creating. Because uh, we, we put thousands of different materials into our homes that contain hundreds of different chemicals. Now, I, ha and I remember reading the statistics on this. I'm not going to make them up because I've forgotten them. But I remember reading them thinking, oh my god, we really haven't tested any of the chemicals that we're putting into materials that we're putting into our houses in isolation. And the thing we have done next to no testing on is the chemical cocktail that we're creating in our internal buildings by mixing these different materials. So the, the, you know, the glues behind laminates, the, the paints, you know, the carpets, all of these. So we spend 90% of our time indoors in developed northern climates. So the internal air quality that we create is absolutely crucial. So one, that's a really important part of what we're trying to create is you know, a healthy environment in which to live. There's no point sort of thinking about sustainability with a biggie of the planet if the internal environment you're creating is not conducive to you know, human health and happiness. So we focus a lot on, 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 on um, glass fibers, mineral walls, uh, polystyrenes. Wood fiber is an absolutely brilliant insulation because when you cut down a tree, you can use about two thirds of it to make timber and you know, bits and pieces that you'd normally imagine. The rest of it, um, about, sorry, a third of it, so about two thirds of it is waste material. One of the things they can do is I can burn it, which we're increasingly doing, which is not the best because it's taking, yes, it's part of the carbon cycle, but it's quite short shifting the carbon cycle that the tree grows and we just burn it. And we need to be getting carbon out of the atmosphere. So what they can do is they can take that wood and they can spin it into fibers and they can press it into boards and put that into the building and that locks that CO2 away Hope for the lifetime of the building, hundreds of years. So really big on that. And the other one we use is, is, is ceramics, where we get sort of stuck. We get a bit caught out. We can use that to get out of a, of a sticky situation. So we designed this building um, to be very simple, as I said. We also designed, once you, you know you're using a lot of insulation, sort of two, 300, mil, like 300 millimeters of insulation. I think that's an that's uh, important point, that we're talking about a lot of it, yeah? like lots of it. And by using, by, by starting off into saying, you know, we can have thick zones for wall insulation, it means you can use cheaper insulation. It means you're not using expensive insulation. But the other thing it has to do is it has to be very continuous. So it's all about creating no thermal bridging. So no little bits going between uh, the inside of the building and the outside of the building. Uh, to the point that if you have a cavity wall, which is a standard way that we build houses, you have a, you know, masonry and stone, and the connected by little bits of steel to make them strong. If you have a wall that's over 200 millimeters thick, you lose half of the energy through the steel cavity ties. So you're thinking about that, and you're using uh, different cavity ties to reduce that. So what we decided to do was create a, a stone, a concrete uh, block box, and then wrap that with uh, insulation. Now, the whole of that box sits on a polystyrene tray. 
It's called a passive slab. So no part of the building touches the ground. So you're losing no heat through the bottom of the building pretty much. And you cast a, a concrete tray within that. And then we, we, we covered that with these timber rye beams. And then we blew that with um, insulation. So we, we're blowing it with insulation because you get a really good fill. You get no gaps. If you blow it in under pressure, really good way of building a house. Um, and then wrapped it over the roof. So now you've got a nice, uh, you know, you've got a really nice sort of thick um, duvet over the whole building. So then air tightness is really crucial. We're increasingly understanding that drafts make buildings uncomfortable. And they, they, you lose a lot of heat through drafts. So if you've got a nice insulated building, you need it draft free. And what's, if you have a building that is draft free, most people will be comfortable at 19 degrees. If you have drafts through a building, that's 21 degrees. So immediately, you've got to have the building significantly warmer for people to be as uh, warm and comfortable. So absolutely crucial you get the building airtight. And um, that's not easy. Because when we're talking about airtightness, we're looking to get to a, a passive house level, which is 0.6 meters cubed per hour at a certain pressure. But with this house, what that equated to is in the entire building, we could have no holes greater than the size of a squash ball. That's every single junction between the, I don't know, 50,000 components that you're putting together. We could have no hole bigger than the squash ball to get the air tightness levels you want for passive house certification. And you really have to think about that. And I think what, what it creates is it's a very quiet environment because there's no sound kind of coming through these gaps. It's a very still environment. So again, it's this idea of you know, increasingly now when I talk to my clients, I don't talk about low energy building as a way of saving the planet, although that's a wonderful byproduct. It, talk to them about creating a really good internal environment. Because if you're in a house that's not losing heat, it is just calm. There is no energy sort of movement. Now, you can go into a house, and it can be warm, and the radiator's at 50 degrees, and the, the window's at 2 degrees, and your front's boiling hot, and your back's freezing cold. But oh, you know, arguably, it's, it's kind of warm, but it's just not comfortable. And a building that's airtight means it's incredibly still and calm, and all the rooms are the same temperature. It, you know, it's a very different environment in which to be. But to achieve that, you have to think. You have to have a very clear strategy of tapes and membranes and control on a building site. And it's a challenge. You know, our, our building industry is not sort of really skilled in this yet. Um, and the idea that you can create an entire building and there is no hole bigger than a squash ball is very hard. Because all it takes is an electrician with a drill and a bit of overexcitement on a Monday morning, and you, you're buggered, basically. You, you know, someone's going back and taping it all up. So you need to be very careful. And the other thing that is really interesting is that in order to test this, you do a thing called an air tightness test. So you, you put in a, a, a fan into the door, and you close all the windows, and you, you, you basically evacuate the building, and then you blow the building up, if you like, and you, you measure the heat loss. And it's one of the only times in buildings that you get a figure, one number that sums up the performance of your building. Because we don't do much post-occupancy analysis. We don't go back to the buildings we've built and go, how are they working very often. And when we do, we find out that the buildings perform incredibly poorly compared to their design level. So th this is one of the great things about the passive house process, is that you're, you're retrospectively testing, and you have to be very careful. So you go around with a smoke pen, and you find all your holes, and you're aiming for 0.6. We got 0.72 on that building. Uh, it was the first time we'd ever, we weren't trying to get passive certification. We were pretty pleased with that. I've just finished my house, which I'll show you later, and we got to 0.62, which rounds down to 0.6. So we got, we got there with that. So, but it's a real learning curve and something we all should be looking into, especially living on a, on a windy, damp island, like you lot do. You might want to. It's really good for that. So you've sealed up the building. You need to breathe. So ventilation. Another, so I talked about a great bit of technology is thermal modeling. Another great bit of technology is mechanical ventilation heat recovery. Um, this is a, a simple system. I'll give, I'm sure most of you know, but I'll give you a simple sort of update. It, it, it's a very simple, it's a pretty simple system that sucks uh, the moist, warm air out of the kitchen, the, the utility room, the bathrooms, puts it through a cross-flow heat exchanger. It's not air conditioning. It just uses um, basically proximity of the cold air and the warm air that they don't touch. To, to preheat fresh air from the outside that you then blow into the living room 
and the bedrooms uh, and those kind of rooms. So, and actually, once you've got an airtight, well-insulated building, this again reduces your energy consumption by about half. So a really good bit of kit. Uh, but it takes space, and it needs to be planned. And a badly installed one is a nightmare. You know, they're, they're worse than having nothing. But, so again, it's one of those things you need to think about early and plan in. But I would never build a house for me without one. Um, ever, because I think the way, what they do for air quality, because you can filter the air, you can have CO2 monitoring in the air, so if the CO2 monitoring gets a bit high, it ups the ventilation rates. And a lot of people say, yeah, but I really like opening the window. How am I going to live in this sealed house that I like opening the window? Normally, the reason people want to open the window, unless they're specifically fond of certain bird sounds, is um, there's not enough CO2 in the air. So it's your brain going, I'm not getting enough oxygen, open the blinking window, or the humidity's too high here, or there's mold in here, or there's something. You know, we're constantly monitoring the environment, and these kind of, oh, just open the windows is a kind of a version of that. These machines uh, can, can help you deal with all that uh, and massively reduce energy consumption, and again, massively reduce noise. Because if you're on a road or anywhere near that, you don't open the windows, you, it comes in through attenuators and buffers. So gr another great bit. Kit, windows and doors, hugely important. They're really illustrative in that they sort of explain in one way how complex building physics is. Because a lot of people over the years have been saying, oh, double glazing, I'm not really, double, triple glazing doesn't really pay, sorry, over, over double glazing. I'm not sure about that. It doesn't if you do a straight sort of, I don't mean this to be rude to any accountants in the room, if you do a straight sort of accountant's analysis of it and go, well, what does a triple glazed window cost over a double glazed window? What is the heat loss through the building relative from a triple glazing to a double glazing? You might, not, you might say, well, we don't get payback on that. But actually, what happens with a double glazed window is, is two things. One is you sense the surface temperature of the building and it makes you feel cold, even if arguably the heat loss through it isn't so high. We're really complicated, you lot and me, we're, we're complicated things. And the second thing that happens with that is that when you have a double glazed window, the surface temperature gets cold enough that the air at the top of the window starts to sink. And it gets replaced by warm air, which gets cold and starts to sink. And then oh, you suddenly set up another draft in your building that you spent all this effort getting rid of. So triple glazing is really important. But almost more important than that is how they're fitted. A bad window, well fitted, is as good as a, a brilliant window, badly fitted. And, and, and a lot of, lot of thought needs to go in, in how you fit windows. It's one of the hardest things, uh, I think, in architecture is to get those kind of those thresholds really, and not just design them, but control them on site. But really important if you're ever replacing your windows is to make sure they're going to be fitted right. So this is what it looked like in the end. Um, you know, quite a simple shape, but we really tried to control the, the detail, that's reclaimed Welsh slate and, and English larch and marine grade aluminium. That's the, the monocular, you know, ice planet Hoff thing there. Um, and, you know, that's the view out, out across the, the valley. And we, you know, so it's just like do less well is a really important mantra of what we try and do in the practice. So, and, and a lot of that's about being very realistic with clients and their budget and saying, yeah, but you can't afford to do that and we're not going to build a big house badly. We'd rather build a smaller house really well because I think in the long term, that's better value for everybody. So, you know, that's what we were trying to do here. We tried to reduce the palette and just make sure we could control it. And, and, and despite we finished, we delivered this on about 1,650 pounds a square meter, which is not, not a huge amount. Um, but we still managed to get some nice sort of joinery in there and, and some real joy. You know, it's a family of... Um, five, three kids, and so, they're, they're, you know, we really, and we managed, you know, we commissioned a kitchen out of plywood and, 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 and stainless steel, and all the kind of joinery we managed to get built upstairs, um, Douglas fir floorboards. And then downstairs was interesting because when we were looking at trying to cost, you know, cost optimize this building, kept looking at the budget and going through it, and there was just this massive cost for flooring everywhere we looked, and what, what constantly frustrates me about flooring is that you, you cast a slab and you go back and you put in insulation and you go and you put a screed in and they go back and they put a floor finish and they go and seal the floor finish. It's like, we've just worked on this floor five times and like there was this massive budget chunk and it was like, well, if we're doing this passive slab, why don't we put the underfloor heating into the passive slab and we'll power float the passive slab on, slab on day one and then we just need to come and buff it and seal it and that's the job done. And we managed to basically pull five or six grand out of the budget 
So that is the concrete floor slab that is the whole building. And that cost seven or 800 quid to get power floated, and then the client sealed it. They're just standard off the peg fire doors, painted, and we got the joiner to make those door handles for about 15 quid each. So it's just like, how can, you know, how can we do some really simple things to try and deliver uh, quality? And the rooms, and, and the other way we managed to deliver it affordably is the rooms are, are not big. You know, we kept the building small and we spent money on, on, on sort of joinery to try and make it, um, to give it scale and to really sort of function. This is another little building that we did uh, down in Cornwall, uh, which, is, um, which is sort of, a, a, the reason I put it in because it's sort of a seaside building, and I thought it's sort of relevant to here. And we, the reason it's this shape is because the south's over here and we wanted to have significant solar array. So there's a, there's a four kilowatt solar system on that, on that roof. Uh, and, it, and it was about sort of replicating the idea of these little agricultural buildings. There was, there was an old barn on this uh, site that we uh, sort of, it was the walls of a barn that we sort of rebuilt. And, and it's actually built, uh, this idea of using the wood fiber. It's built using timber I-beams, which are engineered timber product, which again uses a lot of waste materials. They're very straight, very strong, uh, very dimensionally accurate. And we then built that system and we blew it with wood fiber. So it's Timber, it's timber cladding, some clever membranes, timber boarding, wood fiber and timber, another timber boarding, some battens and a piece of plasterboard. So it's basically a wooden building. So you know, there's tons and tons of timber, CO2, locked away in that building, um, hopefully for the next you know, 100, 100 odd years. So you can, you can see now the solar array, because this is an area of outstanding natural beauty, which is you know, quite a controlled thing in, in the UK. So we, we sort of tucked those in around there, it's got outdoor showers and stuff because it's near the sea for, for, for surfing. And, and we, we re rebuilt this wall, that's a, a new wall that we rebuilt by reclaiming all of the, the stone that was on the, on the stone on the, on, on the site. And those are actually, the timber was, a, was an offcut from a, a, a yard in the Y Valley. A timber yard had all this sort of offcuts of oak that they didn't really know what to do with. So we bought that all off them and made the, made the cladding out of them. So again, you know, just trying to, trying to think about embodied energy, so the energy that goes into making the materials. Um, I think the thing about blowing, for example, with this situation with blue wood fiber, is one of the things I've really understood building my own projects and stuff is, is just the waste, the, the kind of the, that we're all quite wrapped into plastic at the moment. But if you go to a building site and they're soaring polystyrene, they're soaring insulation, there's tiny fragments of plastic going everywhere. And I, on my building site, I'll show you later, you know, I've been trying to control that like assiduously, like really trying to control it, and you just can't. But the idea that somebody turns up with a lorry full of insulation and they blow it into your building, whatever, and also the waste, so you, you get these sheets, and there's so much waste that you just don't know what to do with it. It's heartbreaking. But if you turn up with a machine that blows it into the cavities, and then what they don't use, they take off. It's really important as, as people designing buildings or commissioning buildings that you'll, you control these little things. Do you, do you know, in the UK, they think on standard developer sites, about 10% of the materials that arrive on site leave straight away in a skip and never get used, right? So we have got a massive waste issue that we, we need to get a hold of. And that, that's sort of beholden to the people designing and commissioning to try and control that. So again, really simple sort of building, highly insulated, mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, um, plywood, low VOC plywood kitchen, uh, oak, um, I think, and, and just really, you know, not a big building, 62 square meters, two bedroom, but just using that roof shape, so really expressing that lovely roof shape to create volumes, to create interest, to create this sense of moving through the building, because you walk down that corridor, and, and the roofs sort of go up and down as you walk through it, and then just these kind of... Yeah, I quite like it. Maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, and this is a lovely bedroom. It's kind of like a little hut. It's kind of it's just really nice place to sleep. It feels very centered. Um, and, and you know, we, look, we looked at the garden and, and trying not to do deck chairs and naff seaside stuff. We sort of looked at sleepers and, and groins and gravel and sort of quite, quite kind of hardcore. And there, there's the building next to the little barn that was converted. It was the first part of the, of the, of the project. So, yeah, I quite, quite like that. So renovation. This is, uh, you know, quite a lot of our work is around renovating and actually um, bungalows, or bungalow, as I now have. You can use that too, if you like. Uh, and the reason I love bungalows is they are built on really good plots. 
And, and I've driven around this island. There's a lot of sort of bungalow-y kind of things here, guys. You are gold mine. Um, you know, they're pretty ugly, often. They were built using technologies that were a bit ahead of their time. So everyone that you meet who's over 50 is obsessed about not having flat roofs because they're going to leak. <laughs> don't have a flat roof. You can't have a flat roof. It's like, no, they don't leak anymore. We've been to the moon. We can make a flat roof. <laughs> Chill out. Um, and, and, they're, um, and often the, 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 the kind of the layouts of the spaces are really good. You know, you buy a, you know, certainly in the UK, you buy a Victorian terrace or something like that, and you spend so much bloody money trying to connect the spaces. Bungalows, it's sort of done, you know. So this was a project that, uh, just outside London, this, this woodland site here is 10 minutes walk from the Metropolitan Line straight into London on the, on the tube network. Amazing little site uh, that, that this client bought. And... He said, oh, it's got planning on the site for this horrible sort of three-bedroom sort of footballer's home. And he's like, I don't, a three-story footballer's home. I don't really want to build that. But I don't know what to do. I don't have a huge amount of money. Will you come and look at it? And we went up and looked at it and said, don't knock it down, Johnny. This is great. This is like, uh, it actually, it was really quite an architect's design. Like, the spaces inside were great, although you wouldn't believe it looking at that. But it, they were. But you had to see through the crap to get to it. And, and I suspect you've got a lot of that on this island, you know. Um, and, and, you know, so, so we, we persuaded him that what he needed to do, the problem was it was very flat, there was no texture in the space, it was just the same ceiling heights everywhere you went. And that's a real problem in architecture. You know? I think one of the key phrases about what we're trying to do is texture, whether that's material or whether that's space, whether it's about kind of changes in ceiling heights, changes in widths, just so you feel like you're being spatially sort of manipulated, if you like, as you move through the building. And that's, so we, we persuaded the client, keep the building, take the roofs off because they're pretty old, and in a few cases, the, the timbers might be a bit rotten. Uh, we'll redo the roofs, we'll put a bit of angle on it, and we'll build up the chimney to give it a real sort of peg in the ground so it feels like it's connected to the ground. Um, and we actually managed to reuse nearly all, of the, all the roof timbers. And all we had to build was, a, was an entrance porch at the top. We re, re-changed all the room layouts, but, but we just had to build an entrance porch and, and extend the, the master bedroom down here at the bottom to, to create this really kind of nice uh, four and a half sort of bedroom house. So we started doing the work, and it was London stock bricks. And, and the problem with, with, with when you work, as you probably know, when you, when you work on an old building and you change the openings or you move things around, you get the scars of the, of the change. Now, that, that can, you can work with that, and you can make that a feature of the building, but it didn't seem to be that the walls were big enough to take that. So we made the changes and we managed to persuade the client to paint the building black. And he went for it, which I didn't think he would, but he, he, when we first mentioned it to him, he went <laughs> and disappeared. And then he phoned us up, and it was like on the end of a week, and he phoned us up, and he said, yeah, no, I went home, and I painted the garage black, I bloody love it, let's paint everything black. And it was like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> and the reason we did that was because actually, if you look at trees, I mean, it was a sort of a stealthy thing as much as because there's a grade one listed. I mean, it was so bonkers. I mean, I know it's not quite so relevant to you guys here, but planners are pretty universal. There's a grade one listed, it's like flint napped, beautiful church here. There's this little 60s bungalow, which is an important part of the architectural story of this area. And they were totally happy for it to be knocked down as some horrible, gauche, three story thing. But they didn't want us to paint it black. They were adamant, and they didn't want us to extend. They were ad we had to fight so hard, I mean, so hard to do this simple, sympathetic restoration. So we, you know, we, 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 we sort of pitched up the building. We created these lovely clear stories to kind of angle the light in. Um, you know, really, it, it sort of does this lovely day night thing where the building sort of it does figure ground. Do you remember that from the you know? So you know, the, it sort of inverts o o over over day and night and. You know, and it was all about beautiful views and framing these views and losing the door frames. This was the extension, the, the kind of porch that we built. Uh, porch, I mean, entrance lobby, um, which is an unheated space, but just brilliant because you can come in and this. It's one of the biggest mistakes, I think, in architecture is the size of entrances. They're just too small, you know, en endlessly too small. So this was massive. And actually, they've got a hammock in there now, which is great. I mean, I don't think it's sitting there, but it's nice. Anyway, um, and, and so this was how we reconnected those two spaces. And again, it's one of those things that the key thing was about the, the roof line was so important that you know, it flowed through and these walls became sort of planes in the space and connected it with the internal door. And actually, that plywood, that was a plywood kitchen that we made, which was black. 
and Kitchen John just came and lived on site. Kitchen John, lucky name. But he came and lived on site and made that in like a week. So then this is another bungalow. I told you, we, 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 we're quite a few. This is just another one we're just finishing. So these aren't, uh, these aren't proper photos. So this is a bit of a, this hasn't been properly done yet, but I'm sure, I thought I'd show you because of, I figured, you know, you've got a lot of bungalows. Um, <laughs> and they're not all that nice, some of them. Sorry, can I say that? Um, I have to say, some of your development on this island, you've got a bit out of hand, haven't you? You kind of need to sit down and have a word with yourself, guys. Um, some of it's nice, though, don't get me wrong. Um, right, so bungalow. So we, 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 we clients had this bungalow in a really nice village. And, and again, it was, what do we do? Do we knock it down? I was like, no, I don't think we need to knock it down. Uh, uh, what you need to do is you need to do this. Oh, no, this. Oh, not that. No, you know, that is what you do. I've got it confused. Here we go. You need to do this. So we said, look, again, you need to create space. You need to create you need to create volume, you need to create texture, you need to create interest, and there's an amazing view, so we, we wanted to, 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 to lift the, 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 the master bedroom up. And so we tore the walls down, um, kept, kept, you know, brought the roof off and brought them down. And it was, you know, it was touch and go as to whether it made financial sense, but you know, we looked at it a lot with the client, we did a lot of work on the cost analysis, and in the end of the day, and brilliantly to them, it was really touch and go, I think it cost them no more to keep the structure than it would have done to knock down, even with the fact in the UK, you pay VAT on a, a refurbishment and you don't want a new build. So brilliantly, the government have can create a situation where everyone just knocks down buildings that are probably fine, but they've made a perverse incentive to just trash all of that fabric because they're civil servants, I don't really know why and they don't understand what they're talking about in buildings. So they said, no, we want to keep the structure because there's a lot of CO2 in there. There's, you know, why would you knock it down? It was like, brilliant. And so we reclad it, um, and, and we did that with it, which is quite a transformation. Um, so again, that's large, uh, local stone, uh, you know, using the roofs, uh, you know, pitching the roof, um, and creating this really nice kind of entrance sequence where you walk through this, this beautiful kind of pergola kind of thing, um, yeah. So the, the photos aren't the best, because this was just uh, one of my colleagues on, you know, on site just taking some snaps. But it's quite a nice building, I think. So extending houses. So uh, with, with extensions, I think they're really important. That the main thing about extending a house is don't add more of the same. That's my kind of simple, I like simple rules. Don't add more of the same. You know, try and vary the space that you're going to add to a building so that it, it creates interest. Again, this thing of texture, you know, and if you've got a house that's old, then the extension that you add should have a different character, in my opinion. It should have light and views and connectivity. If you, you know, if you've got a building that's a certain, you know, white and modern, then maybe the extension can add something about more texture and coziness. You know, whatever it is, I, I, it's, no, it's not predicating the outcome. It's just saying, let's just not add more of the same. So this was a, a listed building down in Wiltshire with this horrible conservatory on the side, which I mean, horrible, not just whatever you think of it looks. So the reason it was horrible is you, you could use it for about a, a week, a, an hour and a half a year. I think it was like on a Wednesday in March. And I think a sort of Friday afternoon in, in, in October was perfect. The rest of the time was awful. It was too hot, too cold, absolute rubbish. So the client wanted to knock it down. Equally, this building, I don't know why it was listed because it was absolutely trash. But inside it had this incredibly kind of weird sort of like seven layers of Hades staircase, you know, dark, Thought we were going to get mugged uh, going up it, and um, and so what this for us was about creating light, you know, bringing light. And I think in so many houses they're wrong because of their daylight. Light is where they 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 really struggle. So we we um, wanted to create an extension, and we wanted to re sort of understand how you could get daylight into that building and create this kind of spine. Because the house has actually been done in the 70s. It was really sort of flat, really linear. And there was no moment of connection between the floors. I think that's really important in a building, it, it, is to feel a sense of the space up there and I can get to it. And, I, you know. and so we, we designed actually a, quite a contemporary extension, which was like a deconstruction, if you like, of the local language. So it's, but again, we did it in nice watercolors so the planners wouldn't realize. And I don't think they did. Um, so this is what we did to the step. This has got no lighting, no artificial lighting. So that, those pictures before with no lights on, and this picture is with no lights on. So we, we just sort of opened it and put in some roof lights and pulled the stairs away from the wall, and we um, you know, kind of wrapped it around to try and just 
get the light moving down through the building, which I think was pretty successful. I didn't choose the color of the steel handrail, by the way. I'm still a bit sore about that. Um, and this is the extension that we built, which, which, you know, again, this is a list of buildings. So the client was brilliant. He found a barn that was being pulled down, and we got stone slate roof, oak, lead, glass, local stone back wall. But again, this sort of deconstructing all of those details so that it, it, it sort of speaks enormously to the house, but in a completely different way. Um, and this is what you would see from the road. So again, very, I'd like to think, kind of very sort of simple kind of pattern. You could almost drive past it and not really understand what was going on. And then inside, again, because it had these quite low ceilings, we wanted to create this different space. So we sort of ran the oak up to draw the eye up into this sort of celebration of space and the connection to the garden. But you can see at the end there that the, the, the roof runs out, the ceiling runs out past the glass, so that it creates this sort of overhang at the end of the building, which you can sort of see again there. And that was, a, that was an endless conversation between me and the client. He kept saying, why don't we just make the kitchen bigger? I don't want to make the kitchen bigger. I really want to have this overhang. I think we make the kitchen bigger. No, don't want to make the kitchen bigger. and forwards for, for months. And, and eventually I was like, what, look, Charlie, why are you paying me if you're not going to listen to me? It was, got to that point. It was, that's not a good conversation. But we had it. And I said, look, come on, man. Like, please, just trust me. Trust me. The kitchen's big enough. You, and, and he said, mm, all right, OK, we'll trust you. And actually, brilliant, and fair play to him, he phoned me up about six months after he'd been there, and he said, you know what? You were absolutely right. I've got a little bench out there. I sit out there. I could read the paper. It's absolutely wonderful. And it was, it was very nice to hear. And, you know, because sometimes you question, maybe we should make the kitchen bigger. But you go, no, I think there's an idea here. Um, and you can see that overhang nicely there. And I think it sits quite well with the, with the house. It was, it was a lot of work to get it to look so effortless, as I'm sure Anyone here who designs structure knows it was a lot of, you know, fiddling about. But I think it fits really well. I think it's a good, you know, I think it's quite nice. Um, conversions, I'm really interested in conversions. We do quite a lot of Barney kind of conversions and, and different conversions. I think the thing about conversions, so my thing is add different space. The thing about conversions is I think it's really important that you listen to what's there. And if I see a lot of conversions, whatever they are, I think where they fail is when they, they shout louder than the building that was there. And actually, I think you can find beauty in any piece of architecture, almost. I'm not sure about the, the flat where uh, Alex is making us. But any other, it's down on the seafront here. It's, other than that, it's, you know, you can find beauty in any piece of architecture. And this was, the, you know, this, this, is, okay, this is an easy one to find beauty in. That, that's a sort of a 16th century barn at the stone there. That's a, a, a beautiful manor house. So we're up in the Cotswolds. That's where our practice is based. There's lots of stony kind of, you know, nice stuff. Um, 70, that was extended. And then this kind of quite interesting late Victorian agricultural barn was added on the side. And they wanted to create that into a one-bedroom sort of annex uh, sort of space. But when we went to the building, we kind of went and we really looked at it and listened to it. This is fantastic. I love this space. So these are kind of late um, Victorian um, sort of timber engineering, which was really refined by that point, you know, beautifully refined. Lovely thing I love about it. You see the boards there by the sort of the eaves? They're so you don't put your pitch fork through the slates when you're, you're tossing the, the hay out, which is just a really nice feature. And then you had this slightly older bit with lots of elm, and these, these laths, which we sort of got quite excited about, and sort of, you know, so just storing all this stuff up as, you, you know, as we sort of designed the building. We, and we wanted to create, again, connect the two spaces. So we decided to cut a big hole in the floor, really expose the structure, and, and create a, quite a simple building. Um, so this is it during construction. We used, uh, uh, again, so with a conversion with old buildings, we've done quite a lot. And we use either wood fiber, in this case, we use cork. Um, because the key thing about old buildings where they don't have damp-proof courses and, you know, they, they were designed to breathe. They were designed to have moisture movement in and out. And if you, if you get a wall damp, it, it, it doesn't perform. It falls apart. But also the U-value, so the thermal performance of it goes through the floor. And that's a really big problem with a lot of old buildings is they're sealed up with vinyl paints and gyps and plasters and vinyl paints. And they just can't breathe. So they're wet. So they, they're even colder. You imagine like a wet jumper. It's... It's rubbish, right? So the same with our buildings. So a lot of the work we've done on old buildings like this is about repointing in lime, about liming, li getting all the plaster off, liming the insides, and using corks and wood fibers and lime plasters and lime paints to, to get that breathability, which has a huge kind of uh, impact on the way that it, 
it works. Um, the staircase, uh, you know, we, we put in was inspired by a, um, a stair that I saw in a farmyard in Somerset that was sort of really simple. And we worked really hard to get that balustrade. You see that balustrade going straight through the wood floor? These are actually new floorboards that we put in. Um, and we just sort of cut the hole through the floor. We wanted that memory. We thought that memory was really important uh, part, of the, part of the structure, uh, part of the, the process. So you, you can see when you look from the underside, you see the underside of the, the building. You can see where we've cut the boards. I mean, we sort of staggered the boards to kind of go with the memory. This arch was here. It's just beautiful arch. But say, you know, in a way, not quite, but I almost... In my ambition is you can almost imagine that we hadn't done anything, almost, you know. I think that's what uh, I'd, love, I'd love to believe. So we put all of those beautiful boards, we took them off and carefully, and then put them insulated and carefully put them back up, and really simple balustrade. And then this is the ensuite bathroom, and we use, uh, you're referencing those laths, we use um, the laths that you use for old-fashioned plaster work. They're really not expensive. So we used those and created these lovely screens around. It's a frosted glass behind around this, um, around the, the ensuite. Uh, and then we, we lifted all of the, the stone paving and co collected what we could and reused that in, in a large part of the building. And then we, all the blue stone, all the blue bricks came out and we created those stairs, you know, referencing the idea of a mounting block. So again, it's like the language of the building is there you know, if you look for it and listen, I think. And, and that's really what a lot of what we try and do is, you know, simple materials put together, hopefully in a slightly nice way. Uh, and, and also just not shouting, you know, so we just, just very simply replaced the openings, didn't make any new openings in the building, just sort of let that story come through. And it was the star of the show. Well, that's what we were trying to, trying to do. So that, that's some stuff. So what's on the drawing board at the moment? More bungalow, eh? <laughs> eh? I told you, we bloody love a bungalow. I just built one. That's how much I love a bungalow. bungalow. Uh, and this is, a, this is an interesting one. The reason that it's interesting, is, and I wanted to talk about it, was because a client came to us, and, and he, he bought this house on the right. He was living in it. He's, a, he's my planning consultant, actually. He's a brilliant planning consultant, if you ever need to do any work in England. Amazing. And he bought this bungalow on the, on the left here. And then he got planning to knock it all down and build a big Cotswold house. And it's on a really steep slope. It's in a place called the Slad Valley where Cider with Rosie, so Laurie Lee was. So it's like classic Cotswold, really steep. And just to make the flat space to build the house was like 120 grand. And his budget was sort of 500 he wanted to spend. So it was like, and he got all the way through planning and everything and it just wasn't gonna work because of, you know, they were forcing, they weren't listening to the plot. They weren't listening to the site. They were sort of dropping a solution out of, out of space, and, and so what we persuaded him to do was to refurbish the bungalow on the left, reskin it, flat roof, rebuild the bungalow on the, on the right with something more contemporary, but crucially to sort of step it back up the valley so you're not taking all that soil off site and you're not retaining as much, so you're just trying to save a bit of money. Uh, architecturally, you know, it's quite interesting there because you've got these dry stone walls, it almost feels a bit terracy, like Italy, so we're sort of like referencing this idea of terraces um, down the hillside and, and breaking these volumes up. It's actually quite a large property, but to sort of stagger and step these and put in uh, cedar roofs uh, to kind of achieve this kind of thing. And I suppose, the, 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 so the, the idea, so when I looked at the plans he'd had done, it was like, so Mark, uh, like your kids, how old are they now? Oh, right, they're 21, 22, so they've gone to university, right, yeah. Why do you have five bedrooms? What, what are you going to do apart from dust? those five bedrooms. That's just not, you know, and I think the problem is our houses now are so expensive and we've got quite fixed ideas of what they should do for us. And I think they're outdated in a lot of cases, especially people who are slightly older. And actually what we said to him is, look, you've got a perfect opportunity here. Like, this is your, this is most of your money tied up in one project. Why don't you redo the one on the, the, the smaller one and that could be an Airbnb. You know, that can be an, that can be an income or at least, at the very least, you can just shut it off and not live in it when no one's there. And then when people come, you can open it out and you can live in both buildings at Christmas and Easter or whenever. And I think there's something really nice about this idea of the house, like the modern home being almost like the accordion, you know, that, that, that they can grow when people are there, but you just don't have these empty bedrooms just losing heat and costing money to, 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 to be mortgaged and all of this. So I think we need to really change our relationship with these houses and the kind of the way they work financially for us. And this is sort of an element of that. And crucially, the building steps down the hillside. And actually what, what, 
we did is he, Mark pushed the garage bigger and it's gone back again because it was like, that's not what we were trying to do. But, so it's, it really does step down the hillside and the roof kind of pitches up to kind of look up the valley to where he keeps his sheep, which is nice. Uh, this is another little project, or not little, quite big, um, near us in Chastleton. Uh, and it's, a, it's a lovely barn. It's a really old farmyard that, that somebody owns. It's a real mess of buildings, and, and we wanted to collect it into a really simple set of yards. And, and actually, architecturally, it's a kind of an abstraction of the English country home. So it's about kind of the house up on a podium looking out over the kind of the beautiful wildflower meadow. Um, with a kind of accommodation above. That, that was kind of conceptually where it started, keeping this beautiful listed barn and creating these quite intimate yards. And the client had one really big thing about the brief is they wanted a drum in the middle of it, which we've got, actually I've got really fond of the drum, of the circular thing. It doesn't have the staircase in it anymore, but this was the early idea. And this lovely idea of creating these kind of intimate yards and quite an open piece of landscape. So creating place was really kind of important. And that's where it is now. Um, it's changed, but I think the key thing about it is as the sun moves around, these fins are going to really uh, animate the, the space. And, and it does create this rather these beautiful kind of little cloistered yards, which I think are going to be quite powerful. And it's going to be all about you know, the lovely warm Cotswold honey stone, which is nice. Uh, this is... Um, I've got two more projects, and then I'll shut up, all right? Is that okay? Good. That's good. That's a deal. Um, I wanted to show you another bungalow. <laughs> yeah? uh, and this, this is a, a bungalow that actually we're knocking down and rebuilding. And it's for a Japanese uh, client. She's Japanese. He's English, although he lives in Japan for a long time. And we're creating a, a sort of a courtyard house uh, with a copper roof, because Japanese traditional architecture is all about the roof. You know, the, the roof is the is the main kind of element of, of the building. And so we're creating a beautiful kind of copper roof. Um, and the way we, we, we decided to communicate this with the client was through the kind of language of Japanese comics and manga. So we created this sort of series of images moving through the building that we sort of were trying to communicate um, to, 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 to them about how it could work. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's all nice. What's really sweet about it is, I don't know if you can see here, there's a person sitting in a, in a kind of a window box, because they have these, and I can never remember the name of them, uh, the Harakabang or something, which is like a sun spot, where you sit in a bay window, and you kind of, or in a sun spot, and you, like a cat. She's actually quite like a cat, uh, Mako. So, it's, you know, we've created this. But then what I pointed out is that this is England. It's really wet. So we've got a sun one, and we've got a rain one. So this is the rain one. So all of the, the roof water will come sort of and gush over the outside of the rain spot. And then the sun spot will work for about a week a year. But, <laughs> you know, she'll have the rain one as well. So, so I have been building my house for last year. And it's a bungalow. Um, and, and, and it started, it's interesting. So I, so I lived here on the left. I've lived here for 12 years. It's a little thatched cottage. We did that up like proper lime and wood fiber and rainwater harvesting and wood pellet boilers and, and, and everything. We loved it. It's brilliant. It's about 82 square meters. And I've got two kids. And we just outgrew it, basically. We got really full. The office was based in the barn on the right. And I needed to move. And I didn't. that view is beautiful. And I didn't want to move. So I, I sort of had a planning. This is a conservation area. It's a listed building. It's an area of high landscape value. And I kind of realized the only way I could get planning is if I could knock down that building and create a building, if you know what I mean, like lose a building to get a building, which is a sort of trick. And the way we could do that is because our land runs down to a little stream, and we, um, we, decided, we, we kind of worked out that we could sort of bury into the hillside and, 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 and lose the building and actually put a sort of uh, allotment onto the roof. Um, well, actually, that's, it didn't quite come that straightforward. I think I did four planning applications. It took me quite a long time to get it right. I sort of did various iterations, got planning on them, and then changed my mind. But you can see the idea is that, 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 that you could lose the building behind this very low-level wall. And then on the far side, I don't know if you remember, there's, uh, the, the piers, the, the old viaduct piers there was a really important part of the language. So it's a series of stone piers connected by a ribbon of rusted steel. Um, and, and so what was happening is I was... I was designing the building, and the, you know, all the garden was going to be on the far side of the building. And I was washing the car one day up by the cottage, and I had, I think, 10 conversations with people in the village. And I thought, as soon as I live down there, I'm not going to have these conversations. And 
this little bit of community is going to sort of dry up. So I, I cut the top of the building off, and moved it down, and put the allotment on the roof. Um, it, it, you know, it's quite simple. There's three beds and a little courtyard. And, and so that when you walk onto the building, that's where the allotment's going to be. So I'll be up there badly growing carrots and mangling sprouts or whatever. I, I'm not a great gardening person. But, uh, and, and, and then you walk down through a flower bed to get into the, into the house. And this is what it looks like down at, at kind of lower level. And, and what's interesting about this building is it's quite highly glazed. And, and I mentioned earlier about overheating. And, and I think overheating in, in, in architecture, modern architecture, is a real massive problem. Because if you have a building that's cold, you can turn the heating on. If you have a building that's hot, unless you've got you know, air conditioning, which is not good on, on many levels, you can't. It's, you can't live in it. And I think it's something that a lot of modern architecture gets really wrong. And I've filmed a lot of modern architecture, and I've got hot a lot. So, you know, I really, that's something that we're taking really seriously on this. Every time we do a, I do a project for myself, I try and push it forward a bit. So this one is really about connectivity, smart homes. That's the kind of area I'm in. So basically, with that much glazing, we're looking at an external louver system. And the reason we're looking at that is because, yes, you can control with overhangs and all of that stuff. But actually, that's fine in a predictable climate. But I think the, the UK climate is so varied that it's not, sort of dynamic enough, because actually you want that light and you want that heat. Even in the middle of summer on a cold day, you want some of that heat, but you're just not getting it. So a, a sort of a more dynamic sense of, of, of controlled sun, I think, is really important. We're also using um, controlling roof lights to lose heat. So we're, we're tying it all together. Uh, we've, so we've basically designed these, um, oh, that's not a great slide. We've designed these louvers to sit in front of the windows, which, which drop down to control and the amount of light coming into the building. And it's something I think, given where you are, given the amount of glass I've seen driving around the island, I think it's something you might want to think about. And, and, and the way where it gets smart is that we're tying it into a smart home system. So the, 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 the single box will control the louvers, the roof lights, the temperature uh, in all the buildings, the towel rails, and all this kind of stuff. And, and the only reason I've gone and jumped on this is I have been to so many houses where they're smart homes, and they've gone, yeah, check this out, check this out. Well, oh, it's never done that before. And they're off poking, and they just don't work. And I actually think now the technology has got to a point where it starts to work. So I, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite interested in this new way of, of tying everything together, because it does, it does everything, which could be good or bad. I'll let you know. Watch this space. Uh, but that's where I, I've been the contractor, which has been an experience. Uh, yeah, it's not easy being a builder, is it? Like a, you know, it's not. Um, uh, and, and, and this is where, you know, this is the windows uh, going in, and, and there's, I think, six kilometers of cabling to make it all smart. Um, and these are the louvers kind of in behind the boxes, and, and it's not a blue box anymore. It's slowly getting covered in stone, but we're moving it in about 10 days, so this is a bit out of date, but moving into, but, th but, this, but this is important, because actually that's now got soil on the roof, but you know, the whole point was that you know, we actually gave the view back, if you like, to, to, the, to the people of the village, which I think is really nice. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what we do. Um, um, I hope that was interesting. Was that interesting, baby? <laughs> Thank you.